Welcome to Itasca Waters, Practical Wisdom Series, Season 2. I'm Shirley Legring, your host for today. We have a whole new lineup of speakers and topics this year, and some of them may even surprise and challenge what you know about the subject. Itasca Waters is a nonprofit whose goal is to educate residents in Itasca County about keeping our water clean, both for the environment and the economy. We have been teaming up with like-minded people for 14 years now, and you can read about those projects on our website at itascawaters.org. If any of that is of interest to you, please consider becoming a member or a volunteer to help support programs like this. And we thank our partners shown on the screen for their support in producing this program. Here on the next screen is your guide for today's program. Jeffrey Marr will speak for 30 minutes or so, and then we'll answer questions from you. To submit a question, you only need to click on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and type in a brief question. We will not be using the chat function today. The program is being recorded and will be available for viewing online through our website at itascawaters.org. Finally, we value your opinion. So please click on the survey link, which will be on your screen at the end of the program, or you can complete the survey that will be emailed to you. We thank you for doing that. Today's presenter is Jeffrey Marr, and the title of the program is Do Horsepower and Weight Boating Matter to Your Lake? Jeffrey is Associate Director of Engineering and Facilities at the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory, University of Minnesota. He will be talking about their research and answering questions you may have about impacts of large boat waves on Minnesota lakes. Jeff, take it away. All right, thank you. All right, thanks everybody and thanks for the invitation to speak today. My name is Jeff Marr. I'm a, I'm a civil engineer, a hydraulic engineer that works at the University of Minnesota. I work at a laboratory called the St. Anthony Falls Lab uh, located in Minneapolis right at the St. Anthony Falls itself. I'm looking out right now at the Mississippi flowing uh, pretty high still. Um, and it's just great to be here. We're a hydraulic lab that does research on all kinds of different water problems. Um, today, I'm going to talk about our work over the last few years, focusing on recreational boats, focusing on uh, wake surf boats, as well as non-wake surf boats. Uh, this work is, is being done by a, a small but mighty team here at St. Anthony Falls Lab. I list my teammates with Andy Reesgraf, who's a close colleague and has his fingerprints all over this work, Bill Herb, Matt Luker, Jess Kozarek, and Kimberly Hill. Um, so I'm presenting on behalf of our group today. So what's the motivation for this research? Uh, it really starts back in, in the late 2019, 2020, when we started to receive phone calls um, from different citizens across the state of Minnesota and outside of Minnesota about wake surf boats, uh, wondering if we we're doing any research on this topic. Um, and through that, those kind of communication efforts from citizens, we started to look at this topic. The answer at that time was no. Um, and so we started looking at papers, what kind of information is out there on wake surfing on these larger boats and, and just recreational boating in general. Um, to summarize the kinds of phone calls we're getting, and this is still true today for that matter, uh, I kind of summarize in these four different bullets. We're hearing from people about adverse environmental impacts that they're noting on their lake. So people that are seeing uh, after a, a busy weekend, uh, with wake surf boating happening, they're seeing a decrease in water clarity or signs of erosion and floating vegetation in the water. Um, <clears throat> we get a, a fair number of calls about property damage. So people seeing riprap starting to fail when it's been in place for many years, uh, people seeing damage to their docks uh, or, or even um, uh, damage to boats that are sitting on lifts and so forth. Safety is another concern. We hear about people that are being thrown around on the water. So people in smaller vessels, fishermen or paddlers out, um, not seeing big waves coming and, and, and kind of having a thrill when they're not looking for a thrill. Um, and so, and actually stories of people being hurt uh, by, by not seeing a big wave and being thrown in their, in their boat. And then a big one that uh, we don't really get into in this work, but kind of a common thread through all the calls is a shared use issue. Uh, we all have a lot of 
uh, pride in our lakes in in the ability to to put your boat or put your your body into any water any public waters you'd like and i think one thing we're hearing is that wake surfing is limiting that the the large waves that are produced through surfing are limiting people's ability to get out on the water or they they just can't do their sport or their activity when those boats are out and so that's where you know we're uh, I guess this just summarizes the kind of calls we're getting. And so we have a, a role in this. We're a university, we're a publicly funded research institution um, in Minnesota. And so we see our role, especially the group that I manage, which is an applied engineering group research team to get involved here. And, uh, you know, why is that? We're a source, we should be a source for reliable information, uh, information that's unbiased it's high quality and it's accessible free to access and then we're working really hard especially in this topic to remain neutral uh, we don't want to get involved in policy development um, we are really see, we see our role as data generators uh, not writing policy and law so <clears throat> what i'm going to present today is is an overview of three phases of work um, two of them are still ongoing or, or about to start, but in phase one, which some of you who have been following this topic may have seen some of this already or seen previous talks we've given. Phase one, we're going to call it, is focusing on measuring and, or quantifying the wake waves produced by recreational boats, including wake surf boats and non-wake surf boats. So measuring how big they are, how much energy is within those waves. And the second phase is ongoing right now. Um, this is on measuring and quantifying the term we're using is propeller wash. So propeller wash is the, the jet of turbulent water that's coming off of the boat's prop itself. And we're, we're actually out measuring that and how big it is, how powerful it is, how deep it goes for both wake surf and non-sick wake surf boats. And then the third phase, which hasn't started yet, but we're hopeful we're going to receive funding soon is, is kind of taking both these first two phases and going deeper with them, looking at both wake waves and propeller wash again, um, and then starting to connect that to the actual environment, looking at erosion, looking at uh, forces on the bottom and on the shorelines. Before I get into phase one, I just wanted to put up a few slides about waves. and. I have to say, I, I'm a hydraulic engineer. We study lots of different phenomena. Um, and I continue to be perplexed by waves. Surface waves are a really complex phenomena. And so I wrote here, the physics of surface waves and vessel wakes is a rich topic. This has been studied for 50 years um, and probably even longer, just the phenomena of the waves that you see in this image um, that they, they scale. If, if this is a, a duck or a swan swimming on the water or it's a, you know, an ore vessel out of the Duluth Harbor, they're all going to produce um, almost identical wave patterns depending on certain conditions. What we want to focus on in this study, though, what's important for us in this, you know, citizens that use lakes is um, can be boiled down. And um, let me just throw up some bullets. So first of all, recreational boat is displacing water. <clears throat> what do I mean by that? It means that the hull is actually submerged in the water and as it's moving, it's it's pushing water out of the way or displacing that water. And that's what produces the waves that we're going to look at. Um, there are three pr primary phenomena resulting from the displacement and from the boat's motion. And the first is divergent waves. And that is shown in the photograph below. I'm hoping you can see my mouse here. Um, but I'm pointing at the, the, the waves that we're familiar with that come off the bow and kind of move out uh, laterally from the boat's traveling. Those are divergent waves. There's another type of wave that's produced um, that's called a transverse wave. And you can see it in this image here that kind of cut across the boat's wake itself. And they, they are moving in the same direction that the boat's moving. Those are called transverse waves. And I note on the right here that these are only going to happen at speeds that are relatively slow, below hydroplaning speed. And then the third phenomenon is propeller wash. And I, I'll have a slide on this in a little bit. Um, but this is the, the, the turbulence off of the prop. And you can see in this image a nice uh, prop wash is being shown here. And these are actually the air bubbles that are coming back to the surface uh, from the exhaust of the motor that's injected with that prop wash. 
So those are the three effects that we think are most important in this issue of recreational boating. There's much more involved. There's some really beautiful um, hydrodynamics involved in these waves that I'm not going to get into um, today. But um, so I just summarize these three areas. Another kind of background information I want to give here is let's just talk about displacement of a hull versus um, hydroplaning. So I put three different images in here, and for those of you I'm assuming many of you have been in boats. Um, you've maybe pulled a water skier or you've been a water skier, for example. Um, you've, you've, you know all of these different situations. The top box is gonna be called displacement mode. And these are really out of fluid mechanics and naval architecture. Different, different groups use different terminology, but displacement mode is, think about that as a really slow speed. You're just pulling away from your dock. Um, another one I think about is when a skier is finished and they drop from water skiing and you're going to you're going to putt around and bring them the rope again so they can start. Um, that's in a displacement mode. The, the hull is sitting in the water um, and I've listed some activities, sightseeing, maneuvering or even like trolling with your fishing. That's a displacement mode. At the bottom, I'm listing another one that we're very familiar with, um, hydroplaning. This is a high speed activity. It's when the boat is actually uh, going fast enough that it lifts up on the water surface. And it's actually a condition where the drag, the friction on the hull is minimized. Um, and and that we that's the condition we're under when we're water skiing or we're tubing or we're wakeboarding or just cruising around the lake. There's a middle condition that we've listed here as subplaning mode. And this is a moderate speed. Um, I should say all of these speeds I list here are really for Kind of 20 to 25 foot boats. Um, but you know, you're and it's a transition between the displacement and the hydroplaning. We've termed it, we kind of refer to it sometimes as plowing mode. Um, and this is when the drag on the hull is actually at a maximum. Um, this is the condition that surf boats are operating at. For other boats, um, and especially like I think about when I was younger and was water skiing more, this is a condition you actually pass through. So when you say to your driver, hit it, and they hit that motor and your, your boat kind of pushes through the water and then you can feel it coming up on plane. Well, it's that point just before you come up on plane that is this subplaning mode. It's when you're really displacing a lot of water, okay? And we're gonna talk more about that, but I just wanna put these three stages of hull condition in front of you today. So let's get into project one. This is a study that was started uh, in the fall of 2020. We did field work um, here. And we, what we wanted to study is to, to measure and quantify the divergent wake waves produced by recreational boats. And we looked at both wake surf and non-wake surf boats. So some of the questions are, how big are the wake waves produced by these boats? And we're really trying to move the discussion from those anecdotal phone calls uh, we were receiving to actual numbers. Um, stuck here. Okay, there we go. And our second goal is to produce a report uh, from this work. And I see that this report is now published and you can find it um, here. I can share this website at the end. Um, but that work was published in February of 2022. Um, the study site was in the West Metro area on Lake Independence in Maple Plain, Minnesota. This is an 830 acre lake. Uh, I would say it's fairly typical lake. I'm showing it here on the right. And our study site is in this red box, um, kind of in the Northeast part of this lake. Um, we looked at four different boats and I'm showing right now the first, we, we categorize these as non-wake surf and wake surf boats. This is the first non-wake surf boat. It's a, it's a Larson boat that was uh, 21 feet long, about 3000 pound dry weight. And, uh, and it's a inboard outboard boat. Stern drives, you can see the, 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 the lower unit sticking out of the back of the, the transom here. The second non-wake surf uh, boat we looked at is shown here. This is a uh, Malibu Response LX. This is a boat, it's a direct drive boat where the, the engine sits in the middle of the watercraft and it's a real lightweight boat coming in at around 2,500 pound dry weight. This is a boat that's commonly used for water skiing. It, it's a, it gets up on plane really easily. 
And then we looked at two wake surf boats. Both these boats were manufactured by Malibu. Uh, there were wake setter boats. There was a VLX and an MXZ. Um, the horsepower on these boats was both 450 horsepower. And the, the MXZ was a bit longer. It's 24 and a half feet long. So a, bit, a little bit longer, a little bit heavier boat uh, than, than the VLX. Um, this is a table that shows all four of those boats together. And we put the box around here to just point out the weight differences. And uh, to also highlight that you know, the wake surf boats have ballast tanks on board that you can fill with water and essentially double the weight of those boats uh, during surf conditions. So that, that sinks the hull farther. And so you're displacing um, more water, creating bigger waves. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today, but um, these boats also have different features associated with um, creating recreational conditions. So there's foils. These are hydrofoils that are off the back of the boat that, that um, actually can pull or lift the, the stern of the boat farther or deeper in the water. For surf boats, they often put these um, in a position, angle of attack, so it actually pulls the stern down farther in the water um, to create more drag on the hull. And then there's uh, surf gates that are actually attached or uh, extend out from the side of the boat again in the stern to create additional drag. And these structures help make better surf waves. And I'm not going to spend more time on, on those structures today, but they're part of surf boats. Uh, they're actually even part of the water ski boat. Um, and so these were a part of our testing. Okay, the next couple of slides, I'm going to talk about the conditions that we operated on in this study. And, and I'm going to share two of them today. The first we call condition 1A. And this was a condition where we're trying to produce, uh, for the non-wake surf boats, the largest wave that we could generate with the boat. So I list here the largest wave we're plowing and the speed was 10 miles an hour. For surfing, for the surf boats, we, we, we put it in surfing mode. So this was the ballast tanks were full and we're traveling at 11 miles an hour and um, those other shapers and the hydrofoils were deployed. So that's condition 1A. And I put this image in the upper right so you have a visual uh, that this is the, the kind of condition we're using. Condition two is the hydroplaning condition. So this is all boats running at 20 miles an hour. They're all on plane um, and the ballast tanks and the foils are turned off for the wake surf boats. Okay, so this is a cruising condition comparing these all together. Just quickly on the, the data collection is really important for us. Um, this is something we have good expertise here at Minnesota. Um, and just to summarize, I'm in the upper right corner is Lake Independence in our study site. And we deployed five different positions out from shoreline, different sensor systems that can measure wave height and can measure it really accurately and quickly. The three in blue are mast based. Uh, data collection, and I'm showing that picture in the middle of the slide. It shows one of our masks. And the reds listed as pads are shown in the lower left corner. That is a device called an acoustic Doppler current profiler. It essentially sits at the bottom of the lake and pings sound upwards towards the water surface. And the reflections back from um, everything in the water allows this device to tell us where, what the water surface is doing and the wave heights, and also some information on the velocity within the water. So that's how we got measurement of the wave height. Um, the boats also had sensors on them that told us their position uh, really accurately. And so what I'm showing here is a summary of all of that information. We've got Lake Independence again and our five different sites where we're measuring. And then you can see these colored lines here at 225 feet, 300, 400, and 625 feet. And those are the passes. Those are the actual positions of the boat passing along the shoreline, traveling from right to left. Um, and as they pass by, they generate waves and our sensors then measure those wave heights um, as the boats pass. So the point for you here is that we replicated our passes multiple times uh, at different distances. And we also are making those wave measurements at different distances from those different passes. And I'm gonna define here operational distance. This is a term you're gonna see in the next few slides. That's the distance between the pass where the boat traveled and the sensor itself. And so you can think about that. That's the distance that 
we're going to want to keep boats or the distance a boat passes from shoreline, for example, is going to be our operational distance. Okay. Um, hang with me here. This is a lot of um, deep information, so hopefully I'm not losing people. Um, I'm going to go on and just move into how we analyze this data in this slide. And so um, this is a picture in the lower left of, of um, actual data from our study. So this is wave height. And it might be hard to see, but you can see zero in the middle on the y-axis, the vertical axis is, that's kind of the mean water elevation on a calm day. And as the boat goes by, it generates a wave. And you can see that wave pattern here. And the wave height is defined as the bottom of the wave, the wave trough to the wave crest. And we made these measurements about every 10 seconds. There is a, every, or 10th of a second, there's a data point here. Um, that's wave height. And we push all of this data through software and it helps us find that, that maximum wave height. So that's one of the things we're going to do every time a boat passes. It makes waves and I'm going to calculate, going to find the biggest wave produced. Um, using that information, then we can calculate a few other things. Again, something I'm not going to dwell on here, but we can calculate the power within each wave. And the power is really the rate that the, the wave is moving towards shorelines. It's the rate of energy transfer. And that equation is shown here on the middle of the page. And I'll just point out, um, I'm not going to go through all the variables, but one of the important one is H max, which is that maximum wave height. And notice, note that that's squared. So we know that power is really sensitive to the height of the wave. And it also has T max, which is the, the wave period, which is a time, the time between crest to crest, for example. So it just gives you a sense of kind of how big that wave is from crest to crest. And that's also important in calculating power. Another quantity that we calculate is the energy within a wave packet or a wave train. Um, the first two I showed you were just the individual waves. This is um, actually a calculation where we said, okay, a boat goes by and it doesn't just produce one wave. It might produce, depending on how far away, nine waves or up to 22, 23 waves. And we want to know the total energy in that whole event. And so we accumulate all of the different energies for each of the little waves through the big waves and back to the little waves. And we sum that up. And that's what that red line is. And we total the total wave energy in that packet of waves. And that equation is shown here again, wave height squared times a wavelength um, is the equation. So those the takeaway here is that we're measuring wave height. We're also able to calculate a couple other important um, wave parameters with that information. Okay, so let's look at the data. Um, this is, um, I'm going to show you two plots here, and I'm just going to show you wave height today as an illustration. But here's a plot of condition one. So this is the largest wave or the surfing condition um, that I defined earlier. Uh, so the boats are moving at 10 miles an hour. On the y-axis is the maximum wave height in inches, and you'll see it's up to 40 inches, 45 inches is the maximum we plot here. And then on the x-axis is the distance, that operational distance, how far are we from the boat um, itself as it passes by. And what you can see in this plot is I'm the, the yellow and the green are the non-wake surf boats, and the yellow and I mean, the red and the blue are the wake surf boats themselves. And you can see that under this condition, the wake surf boats are producing the bigger waves with 40, 40 inch waves cl right close to the boat, just 20 feet off the boat, uh, 35 inches, 40 inch waves, where the non wake surf boats are more in the 20, uh, 20 inch height. Uh, the next plot is going to be under condition two. So these are hydroplaning boats the same boats now under 20 mile an hour. And I have this red arrow that points down to the other plot. And what I'm showing here is I'm comparing the y-axis. Note that on the right, the maximum I'm plotting is 18 inches. And I'm showing you on the left plot where 18 inches shows. So this is just essentially zooming in because the wave heights that are produced during uh, hydroplaning are smaller. And again, the green and yellow are the non-wake surf and the red and blue are wake surf boats. Okay, so a takeaway here is the wake surf boats produce bigger waves uh, under both hydroplaning and, and this uh, subplaning condition. But remember, 
I defined earlier these different hull conditions, this displacement mode, subplaning, and planing modes. And those are important because wake surfing, and this kind of dawned on us in the middle of this project, wake surfing is done at this subplaning condition. So it's for non-wake surf boats, we kind of pass through that transition quickly because we want to be on plane. But for wake surf boats, they'll spend, you know, if they're surfing, they're at this condition. So for hours a day, they're sitting at this subplaning condition. So we feel like it was important to compare under their typical usage. Let's compare wake surf boats in surf mode, condition one versus non-wake surf boats in planing mode. Um, and that's what this plot is here. So here's maximum wave height again. Yellow and green are non-wake surf boats and red and blue are the surf boats under that uh, surfing condition. And you can see the separation becomes much larger under if you're looking at how these boats are typically used. Um, the maximum on here is 25 inches uh, of, of wave height. And the summary is shown in the bold here. What we look over this whole 600 feet Wherever you look, the wake, the wake surf boats are about two to three times uh, bigger in height than um, the non-wake surf boats. And so, uh, you know, that's an important takeaway. And if we, we did define energy and power, so we also include those here. This is what total energy looks like. The non-wake surf boats are coming in around a thousand. The, joule, the, the units here are joules per meter. So this is joules, which is a quantity of energy per meter of crest length. So if you think about chopping your, your crest of your wave up into foot or meter long sections, this is how much is energy is in one of those uh, meter lengths. And so the non-wake surf boats are a thousand. You can see that the non-wake surf boats um, are are much larger and we calculate three to nine times greater for wake surf boats when they're in surfing mode than non-wake surf boats. And the same for power, uh, it's even six to 12 times more power in the, um, the wake surf boat waves than the non-wake surf waves. So these are, um, these are important. And um, how can we use this information? So one thing you'll notice, and sometimes we get asked this, well, you know, what, what energy starts to create harm on the lake? You know, what height, what height is too much? Well, the fact is we didn't look at that in the study. We didn't have time to get into the environmental impact story, but we can still use this information to provide some guidance. And what I'm doing here is showing you that same data for wave height um, with some assumptions or some way we enter this. And what we, what we said is in Minnesota, um, the Department of Natural Resources recommends that boat operators stay 200 feet away. And so we, we considered that for non-wake surf boats. That's a 200 feet is something we're all kind of used to. Um, and that those recommendations have been around before wake surfing was around. So we said, let's enter this data 200 up to where non-wake surf boat wave heights are. And you can see that's about six inches of wave height. If you extrapolate that out, then how far do you need to get, a, get away for the wake surf, wake surf waves to reduce in size to an equivalent height? And the data is not perfectly clean and everything, so you do your best here. Um, and that's what we get to do when we're engineers is kind of do our best um, work, uh, do our best assumptions here. And what we decided is that greater than 500 feet is needed for that non-wake, for the wake surf boat wave heights to decrease to a point equivalent to a non-wake surf boat at 200 feet. So we can do the same in these two plots for if we consider energy, let's say energy is the most important or power is the most important. The conclusion is really similar. Um, we, need to, we need wake surf boats surfing to stay 575 feet or even 600 feet away for those energies and powers to decrease to an equivalent of what non-wake surf boats have. Okay, so that's really what we come out of with the primary findings from our first study that, um, first of all, you know, we, we compared these boats, we quantify the difference in wave characteristics between planing condition and transition to planing or this subplaning condition. In all those cases, the wake surf boats produce the largest waves under all conditions. And that makes sense because they're made to make big waves, they're big boats. Um, how a boat is used is important to consider as the wave characteristics are vastly different between how you, how you use the mode, 
how, how they're used out on the water. And that's something I think um, was an aha moment for us is that wake surf boats are really a new way, you know, a new um, operational mode on our waters. And so that's why we really need to think about their use and, um, and their safe operation. Our data suggests greater than 500 feet are required to achieve um, similar characteristics to non-wake surf boats. So I'm gonna keep going, but this is the this is a really wraps up what we did in phase one. I wanna just take 10 more minutes and talk about the, the second two phases of work. This is our second phase work. It's focusing on what we call propeller wash. And I have this little cartoon here that shows what I mean by propeller wash. The gray triangle is the jet of water that's projected down into the into the water column. Um, and you know the uh, Newton's third law of motion, right? Every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So for this, these boats to move forward, they need to be pushing off the water. They need to have a reaction force. And that's what prop wash is. Um, this project, the objective is, again, like the previous study, is really to measure, quantify, and quantify the characteristics of prop wash produced by boats, because the literature is just not there um for us to, to to understand the impacts and we're going to study both wake surf and non-wake surf boats some of the questions we hope to answer how deep does propeller wash penetrate into the water column at what depth does propeller wash begin to interact with the lake bottom and what happens when it does um other questions about how long does it take for the turbulence and the velocities in the water to to subside um and again to try and put some numbers on on observations and then, of course, we really are hoping our goal is to produce a report that we'll publish um, and make accessible for y'all. This work was done on Lake Minnetonka. It was done um, here in the Twin Cities. Uh, most are familiar with Lake Minnetonka. Here's a graphic of it. We were working on North Arm Bay, and the red box shows where we were working. Um, and this is another view, even closer view of, of what our study site looked like. So this is an aerial view um, that Andy has drawn showing different things on here. It shows essentially the boat paths are these colored lines. So we move from the top of the image to the bottom with these different boats and they pass through a couple buoys or they were marked red buoys, uh, essentially two locations where, sens where sensors were located on the bottom of the lake and we measured propeller wash. So some of the other sensors here in the, the blue X is light and temperature changes, uh, chains that we're measuring uh, temperature changes in the water column. We had water quality sons that measured turbidity. Um, we had our velocity meters located on the bottom. And then um, we also made uh, water quality samples. This is an image of that, again, the ADCP that I showed you earlier, uh, mounted on its mounting pad. This was deployed in 27 feet of water. And we also put a different kind of sensor. This is another velocity sensor that was downward looking, um, measuring just maybe nine, 10 inches off the bottom and um, measuring the velocity. And these were all, we had quite the sophisticated contraption here to drop these down to the lake bottom and then put these buoys out um, so that the boat had a narrow kind of goalpost to go through. So we were certain the boat is going over the center line of the sensor. And I can tell you that was a lot of fun to deploy every day. So um, we also did water sampling and this is important work. Um, we grabbed, these are called Van Dorn samplers. Uh, we, we kind of made our own sampler here. This was made by one of our undergrad students last summer and, and worked perfectly this fall or last fall when we collected water. So this just grabs water samples at different depths. And the important point is we did this before the start of the experiments, and then we did it after the first pass, and then we did it after a fifth pass. Um, so we have kind of the history of how water quality changed as the boats drove over. Um, the different boats we looked at here, um, we looked at some, some big boats in this study. We looked at uh, five in total, three were non-wake surf boats, and I'm showing these here uh, in the photographs. The, the left one is more of a typical boat, 20 foot long outboard. Uh, the largest on the right was a, a massive cruiser yacht that was um, uh, you know, 36 feet long with 760 horsepower uh, motor in it. So you can see the big range of, of boats we're looking at here. Um, 
the wake surf boats, two boats looked at here. One was a Nautique Super Air G23. This is a state-of-the-art boat. It was a 2022 boat, 600 horsepower um, engine in this boat. And then we looked at the same wake setter we studied previously. It's 450 horsepower boat, 21 foot length um, wake surf boat. Okay. So those are the boats in this study. Um, and some of the conditions here, we, we I do a little flip-flop on the conditions, but in this study, condition one is going to be the on-plane speeds. You can see all those boats are running at 21 miles per hour, except that big yacht. We had to go a little bit faster to get it up on plane. Um, so those are those speeds. And the ballast tanks were not full for the wake surf boats. And then in the um, Condition two, we're going to look at that subplane speed where the boat is just at that transition again. And um, it's uh, the, the, the speeds for these boats for the non wake surf were, were nine miles per hour. For the wake surf boats was 11.6 miles per hour with the ballast tanks completely full and all of the other surf gadgets deployed. OK, so those are our. Um, Condition, um, you know, each boat made five passes through this this little goalpost course, and uh, we also waited between each pass so that we could let the um, let the turbulence die off. So that should give you a picture of kind of what the test is. Um, we're not going to be. I'm not going to share with you today the results of this because it's it's really not well. Number one, because we're still analyzing data, uh, and number two, we want to be really careful for all all of us involved in this that we're sure this work passes through peer review before we share our results and findings. But I did want to share a couple data glimpses. I guess um, this first this first um, image is 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 actual data from that sensor that sits at the bottom, I described it as the ADCP. And this is a sensor that sits down on the bottom and it looks upward. So what you're seeing here is time on the um, x-axis. And this is, these are just data points. This isn't any clock time or anything, but this is time um, on, the, on the bottom axis, the horizontal. The vertical is water surface. And at the bottom is the lake bottom and the top is the actual water surface itself. And this is one pass of the boat going over the sensor. And what you can see here is some really strong reflections that come off of what is the prop wash signal. Um, it's not entirely the prop wash because this is data that is called echo data. It's just listening. Um, it's look, looking for big reflections in the sound that's sent out. And what we think this is, is a reflecting off the bubbles, the air exhaust that gets injected into the water. So the bubbles somewhat follow the prop wash, but at some point the bubbles start to rise uh, themselves because they have their own, their own buoyancy. But it's a really neat data set that shows um, the, the depth of bubble penetration. And plus it shows uh, just some other complexities and the, the two lobes here that are forming. Um, so this is information we're looking at um, further. And um, here's, a, here's that same pass. So this is another pass that's showing, and now this data is actually vertical velocity. So think about a particle in the water column and it's going to move up and down if it feels prop wash or it feels some other wave effect. And so the, the intensity, I, don't, I can't remember which direction is which, but let's say red is moving upward, blue is moving downward. And you can see here that the real clock time, this is 1.36 in the afternoon. Um, and you can see, so the total duration between um, the start of this prop wash and the start of the next prop wash on the right of the figure is 15 minutes. And what's interesting in here is you see these um, blue and red events that are really, we'd say, long time scale. They're kind of minutes long where you have downwelling and upwelling in the water caused by this boat pass. Um, that's really interesting to us and something we're looking at right now. If I zoom in on this graphic, you can even see something more interesting. Now, this is just 45 seconds or so of information. And what you see is additional oscillations in the vertical water, water column. Um, here, as you see these bandings that oscillate from kind of a red yellow into a green blue. And the, the time between those are about three to four seconds. And that happens to be the same period or wave, wave the period of time that we see on the surface of the transverse waves that are behind the boat. 
And I defined the transverse waves earlier. And so this is kind of interesting finding for us. We're seeing, you know, we kind of weren't really looking at the transverse waves previously. And um, this seems to be something important for us to look at is the impact of the transverse waves that are formed in that subplaning condition. Uh, this is a, a surf mode pass right here. So, um, so again, these three plots were just teasers to show you uh, what we're working on right now. Um, I can, yeah, so we're just working. There's a lot of data here that we really need to pour through and, and that's what we're doing. Um, so what's the next steps in this phase? We're hoping to finish the data processing of all of this. Uh, we're, we're beginning to draft this report right now and we're, we'll be submitting it for peer review and then that usually takes you know three months to finish and then we hope to publish this um, uh, this year and, and get it out there. What are the incomes? What, are, what outcomes of this um, the project? So what we hope this work really helps us all understand characterization of the prop wash, things like how deep a penetration is the prop wash going, how long does it last, what are its internal structures and things like turbulence, velocities, and things like that. We hope to document changes in water quality, if any exist, from the prop wash at 16 feet and 27 feet, which is what we've measured um, where these sensors were deployed. And finally, um, we really want to kind of provide information that can help safely operate, you know, what's a safe operational depth for recreational boats, which is the question we're really asked all the time. You know, what's a safe depth for wake surfing or for other boating activities? And I, I think we're on track to answer these questions based on what we're seeing so far. So finally, um, oh, I just, this is an important slide. Uh, both these first two phases were funded through crowdfunding campaign, which means um, all this work was funded by donations from citizens, from individuals, from organizations that are passionate about our lakes. Um, they might, uh, and passionate about preserving our lakes and using watercraft appropriately. And so we're really grateful for that support. Many of you on the call are, are probably supporters and there's just literally hundreds, I think 200 in the first phase and, and this recent one is, I think we're up over a hundred donations. On this phase two, we've raised $135,000, which is incredible um, to have research funded that way. And it really signals that this is an important topic for people. Um, I put a website here. This is our general project website if you're interested, and I can share this again at the end. Um, we're posting updates on our work, and you can join our um, kind of our, our, our newsletter. And finally, I just want to talk about phase three, just a couple slides here, and then we'll stop for questions. Um, this is a project that should start this summer. It will focus on both the prop wash, uh, shown in the left, it will look at um, boat waves again, but also wind waves and how what wind waves impacts. And then we really hope to bring in, we will bring in the environmental impacts on sediment on shorelines into this study. This work is going to be is funded by the state of Minnesota through the LCCMR and uh, at $415,000 and it's a three year project. So that's significant funding from the state, um, from all of you and taxpayers. Um, and it's fantastic. And then uh, just outline the three years of work. First year, we'll look at prop wash. In the second two years, we'll identify some study shorelines to, to really study boat wave and wind wave impacts. Um, so that's where I'm going to stop. And I just, again, thank you, um, Titasca Waters, for the invitation uh, and, um, and put our site up there. I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Jeff. Uh, we'll move right into our Q&A portion. Uh, Bill Granches uh, will be hosting the Q&A. He's the director of Itasca County AIS program and a longtime board member of Itasca Waters. Bill? Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Q&A section of this program. Uh, just as before, we'll be using the Q&A section. We are not using the chat function. So if you have your questions, please uh, go ahead and type them in. Now I'm gonna read the questions out loud here and then they'll be answered by Jeff. Now, we, it's very possible that we may combine some similar questions together. So uh, if we don't get to your questions, please feel free to email us uh, after this program. And we do have quite a few questions here that were emailed in from people um, already. So I can practically guarantee you we won't get to all the questions. So 
Without further ado, uh, Jeff, your first question is, is it reasonable to claim that 180 tiny wind waves have the same impact as a few 16 inch high waves? Wow. Okay. Um, the question is getting at, uh, a, it's a wind wave question, which we often hear. And um, and I, I let me just summarize it another way. You know, when a storm wave can, can last for four hours or more, right? We can have a shoreline that's hit with wind waves. How does that compare to um, smaller number of large boat waves? Um, that's what we hope to get to in our third phase. We haven't studied in this project wind waves themselves. And so I can't answer that directly. We will study storm waves and, and actually make measurements on suspended sediment concentrations or changes in erosion, things like that. Um, what I do think a couple things. I think a lot of times in natural systems, we think about a threshold towards failure. And we think we know that different shorelines and same in rivers, that shorelines can armor themselves and kind of protect themselves because they're used to seeing a certain type of wind wave. Um, it's when you exceed that, that condition that it's kind of equilibrated to that you start to see failures. Think about if you put riprap on your shoreline, when you design that riprap, you design it to a maximum wave height that you're going to see. And so the riprap any smaller than that wave can handle it. It's when you exceed that, that mm -hmm. things can go wrong. Um, so that's why we think about thresholds and perhaps you know, wake enhancement, uh, enha wave enhancing technologies and boats can exceed what lake shores have equilibrated to. The second thing quickly is that wind wind driven waves are extremely uh, sensitive to the fetch, the, the lake distance, and also the mm. prevailing wind directions. And, and um, you know, boating isn't. So there are shorelines that see the big winds all the time, but and, and, and armor themselves for that. The question that we want to look at is boat waves can bring big waves to anywhere on the lake, even lakes that are sheltered and don't see big wind waves. And that's that's the thing we want to um, try to get at with our study. So hopefully that answers some of the question. Thanks, Jeff. The, the questions are just really starting to pour in now. Um, uh, real quick, is there going to be a PFD available of this pre state uh, um, PDF of this presentation available? I believe so. I'm happy to share a PDF with, with Itasca Waters to post. Okay, so yeah, people can uh, uh, let us know your email address and Itasca Waters can get that to you. We'll post it on our website. Okay, next question. Um, some of these are scientific and some of these are more policy, but anyway, uh, is the Minnesota DNR in a position to regulate the type and size of boats and motors based on the size of the body of water if wake boats are determined to cause more environmental damage than previously known? Uh, this person lives on Sissy Backwood Lake, uh, which is approximately uh, 1,200 square acres in size. I think the answer is at this time, no. We have not had a, a lot of contact with Minnesota DNR. I think they're studying the issues. Um, they're certainly hearing from um, stakeholders involved in the issue. But to our knowledge, I don't know that they're preparing any decisions like that. Okay. Well, here's one loaded with acronyms, which invasive species we're used to, but I don't know what some of these are. Hopefully, Jeff, you do. Um, if you are comfortable speaking to this issue, what generally did the ADV show that was not shown by the ADCP? Um, so, oh, uh, well, let me explain. The ADV is the device I showed. It's the black tube. It's a oh, sure. it's acoustic Doppler velocimeter, and it measures velocity at the um, at a single point at the bottom of the lake. Um, it's hard. To, I mean, I don't think I can answer that question because we're still looking at that data. I'm going to, I'll be able to, I'll be happy to come back in a year and tell you all about what the, what those data say. You know, it's, it's impressive, the, the quality of the, the uh, testing and the data that you're doing and um, off script here completely. Um, kudos to you for waiting for the peer review. Everyone knows how much pressure is coming to bear on this and how important this is. 
Uh, so it's fascinating to see uh, a detailed explanation of science behind some of the findings that are going to be coming out, hopefully this year. All right, next question. Thanks. You're welcome. In, in phase three, will you be testing the largest wake boats that are being manufactured now? Assumption is longer, heavier, larger ballast capacity, larger horsepower wake surf boats will produce wakes that are more detrimental to those wake surf boats tested in phase one. Mm -hmm. the, we have not decided though the wake surf boats will study in phase three or any of the boats. Um, the first part of the next phase is uh, funded by the LCCMR will be prop wash. We looked at, I'll just tell you, this is my view. I don't know if Andy and the team would agree, but um, we looked at mighty big boats on Lake Minnetonka. I would mm. say from what we see on other parts of the state, you're not running 36 foot yachts. Um, and so we'll have to look at what those findings say. And then, you know, one consideration is we, we've test the same boats, um, but we could also look at Lake boats that are more common, more, more common wake surf boats that are around, uh, you know, central and north central Minnesota, west Minnesota. Um, so I get, the answer is we haven't decided, but I, I think know that we're going to think hard about selecting boats that are representative of the concerns that are out there. Very good. John B asks, when will phase two, when will the phase two report be available this year? Oh, the big question. Um, yeah, there's a, so the phase two report, uh, a lot of, again, a lot of supporters out there are really important information to get out to people. Our hope is that that, that report is out. It's not going to be out in the summer. It'll be the end of summer fall before that's mm -hmm. peer review and we get it out. Very good. Ooh, here's one. Uh, Chuck B., uh, is the uh, SAFL working on an instrument cluster that can be deployed by lake associations or individual citizen scientists? Um, that's a great question from our friend Chuck. Um, this, is a, this is another part of our project that we've been working on kind of in the background the last couple of years. This is, the idea is a, a wave monitoring technology that is cost effective, that lake associations of all different scales could afford um i call it the you know the cheapo wave sensor that um could be put out and we've made good progress on that we had a student last summer work on you know how to collect that data how to transmit it the telemetry so it can be beamed back here to the twin cities actually deployed it out in the bemidji area of the state more work to do on that um, chuck and but I think it's uh, something we'll continue to work on this summer. The, the big part of that is citizen science. So if those of you have been involved in citizen science, it's, it's easy to say citizen science work, but it also requires a lot of um, uh, framework for training people how to do it. So making sure the data comes back is of the quality we need. Um, so I think the technology side is in a good place. It's now just kind of finishing that and then building out um, the, the framework for how you do this in a citizen science mode. But to, to, to describe what Chuck is asking about is, you know, this technology that we could, could show up all across the state and be monitoring what wave heights are, possibly being tied to what boat, boat activities are out there. And all that data gets collected and helps, you know, all of us understand what, what um, wave impacts are. Okay, it is a nice good. idea. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, definitely but quality of data, I mean, that's what it's all about. Um, okay, this is gonna be our last question. Wind waves versus boat waves effect on lake bottoms, just like the question regarding shorelines. Um, sure, there, <clears throat> there's a lot in that. Okay, so um, what maybe I'll start with because it's a, I'm going to assume more general audience is it's really easiest for, for us to look at waves on the surface and think they're just surface effects. But the fact is that waves penetrate pretty deep into the water column. We think about one half of the wavelength is the depth that waves are impacting the water surface. And so in, in deep water, they're not feeling the bottom. But when we start to get into the littoral zone, 
um, into shallower water, the waves are starting to feel the bottom. They're actually modifying their shape. We, we see waves actually grow. Um, they get taller as they start to push up on the bottom. What it's doing is it's actually pushing some of that energy into the lake bottom, and that can result in um, moving of sediment. It can be moving of uh, vegetation. Um, so that's a really important question. It means that, that waves have to think about the site specific specificity of, of where you are. So if you're in a really deep lake that's deep all the way up to the shoreline, you know, none of that energy in the wave is getting dumped into the bottom. It's all hitting the shoreline itself versus a shallower setting where maybe some of that energy is being partitioned into the lake bottom versus the shoreline. Um, so it's something we, you know, you and there's often in environmental research, you can't cover everything. There's so many variables in these systems. You know, every lake is different, every shoreline. What we do is we just keep at it. We keep doing good data. We pick some lakes. We're going to pick a few more sites in these next few studies. And, you know, over time, we start to really can bring in these other variables about how shallow it is, how steep is the slope, and what kind of bottom is it gravelly or sand or clay mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing so i don't know if i got if there was actually a question there but just a comment that absolutely waves hitting the bottom is important part of this story um and uh, i guess i'll just say that's we'll get into those things in the third phase i think that that handled it quite well all right that's all the questions we have time for right now so thank you jeff and thank you everyone listening for all those great questions now, very quickly before i turn this back to shirley i want to let everybody know about this great opportunity uh called the a, um, um, ais detector aquatic invasive species detector certification program through minnesota uh, water scholarships um, university of minnesota aquatic Invasive species research center and university of minnesota extension has put this class on now for several years. It's a fantastic way to learn about aquatic invasive species, how to tell them apart from native lookalikes, how to report them. It's a phenomenal class. It's $190 value and it's free. Just go to the Atasca Waters website, uh, atascawaters.org. Uh, there is a self-paced online uh, portion of this. This takes about, oh, maybe six hours. And then there's an all uh, there's a two day online course that you have to attend everybody same time from nine until noon on June 13th and 14th registration in the class is available now. I highly recommend everybody to do it. It's a phenomenal class to help raise knowledge about the aquatic invasive species. Okay, Shirley, let's go back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Bill. And thank you, Jeff, for all that great information. If you would like to watch this program again or recommend it to any of your friends, you can find a recording of this in a few days. It takes us a little bit to get it up online. You can find it at itascawaters.org. We would love to get your feedback, and a link to this survey will be on is on the screen. And you will also be getting an email survey. So we hope that you can fill out one of those because we would love to hear your uh, response. Our next program will be June 1st, and our speaker will be Dr. Amy Schrank talking about invasive cattails and are they taking over our lakes. I'm Shirley Legring and thanks for being with us today.